Well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cynthia Chang, and um, I guess I, all the other speakers were asked to talk about immigration, and I am the oddball out. So I promise I did not miss the memo, but they did. <laughs> but they did ask me specifically to talk about astrophysics, and so I'm going to tell you a story tonight. But it's going to be very different from the other stories you've heard, and mine's going to be about adventure, and it's an adventure that we went on in order to learn about um, what happened in the universe in its distant past. And so this is um, our adventure story. Um, so the study of the universe as a whole is known as cosmology, and cosmologists in general are interested in understanding the big picture. So that is the, um, the history and the evolution and the structure of the universe on its largest scales. So the sorts of questions that we like to think about include how and when did the universe begin, what is the fate of the universe, and what is the universe made of, things like that. And of course, these questions, uh, humankind has thought about these questions for as long as we've existed. And to illustrate how old and profound these questions are, I'm showing an illustration from the 1800s, uh, which shows a curious observer, and he's peering into the heavens and trying to understand what lies beyond. Now, of course, there's a lot of artistic license in this picture, um, but actually, um, the spirit of this picture is very similar to what we do today in present modern day cosmology. Um, but thanks to the advent of specialized telescopes that we've been able to build and precision observations, we can actually begin to address these grand questions in a precise scientific and qualita uh, quantitative manner. Um, so if we fast forward from the 1800s to the present day, this is a picture that shows a timeline or a map of the universe as we understand it today. So we believe that the universe began its existence 14 billion years ago in a, la in a large explosion called the Big Bang. And since then, the universe has been expanding and cooling off. Now, as the universe has evolved, there's been a few significant milestones in its history that I've outlined here in the picture. Um, so starting at 0.4 million years after the Big Bang, the universe became cool enough for the first hydrogen atoms to form. Now at this point, the oldest light that we can observe in the universe, which is known as the cosmic microwave background, was released. Now after this point, the universe was just filled with neutral hydrogen, and it was a very dark and boring place for a very long time. And the cosmic dark ages lasted until about 100 million years after the Big Bang. And at that point, the first stars ignited in the universe, and dawn appeared in the cosmos. And after that, the universe continued to evolve, more structures appeared, including the stars and galaxies that are familiar to us today. And we as observers sit at the very center of this picture, looking out, and we're trying to fill in the details of this strange and wonderful picture. So for tonight's story, I'm going to focus on one particular slice of the universe's history, and that is this period known as Cosmic Dawn. So during this period, the first stars ignited in the universe, and we as cosmologists would like to understand in greater detail um, what the universe looked like during this part of its uh, development. So we, um, we, we believe that cosmic dawn took place between 100 and 400 million years after the Big Bang. And that may sound like a large set of numbers to you, um, but I want you to think about, let's take the whole 14 billion year existence of the universe and compress it down into a human's lifespan. Now, if we were to do that, then the period of cosmic dawn would actually correspond to the first few years of a human's lifespan. And so in other words, if we take our telescopes and look back at cosmic dawn, we're essentially trying to study the universe when she was a toddler, and she looked very different back then. So that's, that's sort of the science that we'd like to do and what we're interested in studying. So now that I've told you what kind of science um, I'd like to do, I um, have to tell you how we're going to do it and what we're going to look for. So luckily, um, uh, for observational cosmologists, our, uh, our tool of choice for understanding the universe is light. We have telescopes and we look at light of various sorts. And thankfully, during the period of cosmic dawn, the universe was filled with neutral hydrogen. And hydrogen has a very special property in that it glows with a very specific kind of light. So it turns out that hydrogen atoms emit radio frequency uh, light. And if we can tune in our telescopes to observe at frequencies between 50 and 150 megahertz, we can literally listen in to the period of the first stars igniting in the universe. So that's the game plan. And so now you might be wondering, how are we actually going to do this in practice? So how do you catch a radio wave? Well, um, there's good and bad news here. So the good news is that you may have recognized the megahertz numbers that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, because FM radio stations all broadcast in this range. And so that's great, because if you wanted to measure a radio wave at 100 megahertz, 
All you do is go to your car stereo and turn it on and you're set to go, right? But with all things that sound that easy, there's always a catch. And the catch here is that if you tried to build a Cosmic Dawn telescope and put it at home, all you would pick up is your favorite radio stations, all the popular music, and all of that would drown out all of the cosmological signal that you're trying to pick up from the sky. So you would never be able to see the signal that you're looking for. Um, so that, that's very sad. So then you might be wondering, well, what is a cosmologist to do um, given this dilemma? And so the solution in this case is to leave civilization behind. So we want to get as far away as possible from the radio stations and find a very quiet place so that we can see the sky and none of the contamination that we create. And so this is where our adventure begins. Um, so it turns out that South Africa owns a research base on Marion Island, uh, which is shown in the upper right-hand picture over here. And you can see that it is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. It is 2,000 kilometers away from the mainland. And I can tell you, you don't pick up any radio stations from there. So the story I'm going to tell tonight is about our research team at UKZN. Uh, we went on a voyage to Marion Island this past April, and we set up a new radio telescope in order to try searching for the signature from the first stars igniting in the universe. Right. So I'm going to start off by showing the final telescope that we set up. Um, our experiment is called PRISM, which stands for Probing Radio Intensity at High Z from Marion. And this is the instrument in its full glory. Um, I'm excited to share with you tonight that this is actually the first astronomy of any sort that's been done from Marion Island. And so we really are exploring uncharted territory here, which is quite exciting. So now in science, the story isn't just about the theory and the technology, but it's also very much about the people. And there is a significant human element to this. And so I wanted to share a picture of our students who were the members of the deploying team to Marianne this past April. Now, the instrument that you saw on the previous slide was designed, built from scratch, and fielded entirely by students. And so they get all the credit for making this work. And not only that, um, but they, um, they spent three weeks on Marion, and it's, three weeks is a very short period. And so they had only that amount of time to set up a fully functional, robust system that could be left behind for a full winter. And during that three week period, every day they spent two hours hiking through cold weather, fires, lava fields, ice pellets, you name it, to get to our site, work on the equipment, and hike back. But it is all worth it for the love of science. And, uh, but it is thanks to their hard work that I'm able to stand here today and, and share this story with you. All right. So uh, fielding a telescope to a remote location is, uh, is a pretty scary experience. And so I'm going to share some photos just to illustrate some of the challenges that we faced. Um, and so this photo shows um, our cargo being delivered to our site, which is located four kilometers away from the main base. There are no cars on the island. And so yes, we walk those four kilometers every day in order to deal with our instrument. And what you see are these three tiny orange boxes, and those contain all of the pieces of hardware that we need to construct our radio telescope and leave it fully functioning for a year. And so what this picture doesn't capture is just how nerve wracking it is to tell the helicopter team, like, yes, we are OK to go. You can dump us off in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Right? And so the best way, the best, the best uh, encapsula uh, encapsulation of the feeling that I could come up with were these lyrics from U2, which is, the only baggage you can bring is all that you can't leave behind. It really is a little bit nerve wracking, um, but it's okay. And so we started unpacking our uh, containers and everybody got to work. And this is one of our team members assembling the telescope structure. And uh, thanks to a lot of careful preparation and hard work, we were actually able to get everything set up within a few days. And remarkably, it all worked the first time that we tried it, which was um, kind of a miracle. I'm grateful for that. Um, but what is even more remarkable is that when we looked at the observations that our, uh, that our antennas took, we could find no evidence of contamination of radio, uh, radio interference that's created by humans. So no radio stations of any sort. All we saw was clean sky. So as far as we can tell, Marion Island is probably the most radio quiet location that we have ever observed from. And now we have a new instrument in place that's taking observations. And we really hope that we'll have a clean shot of seeing this signature from the first stars igniting in the universe. 
So that's where my story for this evening ends, but it's actually just the beginning um, because we have this new telescope installed and now it's going to continue observing for the winter season. And so even though our team has come and gone from Marion, we have passed the torch onto Kagiso Malepe, who was shown in this photo. And he is the superhero of the next chapter of our story um, because he is the person who is spending the winter on Marion to take care of our equipment. So when all is said and done, he will have been there for 13 months. <laughs> I can tell you the internet from Marion is pretty bad. So. <laughs> So anyway, a huge, huge shout out to him. So I hope I've convinced you tonight that with radio telescopes, we can really explore some interesting and exciting uncharted territory in the universe's history. And in particular, this period of cosmic dawn should be pretty fun to look at um, because wouldn't it be nice to see the first stars igniting in the universe? And in our search for you know, exceptionally radio quiet um, locations and clean skies, our adventures have taken us to Marion Island, uh, which seems to be a wonderful new location for radio astronomy. So we have our equipment up and running now, and we're doing our observations. So please stay tuned to find out what we can learn from this very special location. Thank you very much.